Good afternoon, and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be hosting this discussion. Before we begin, I would like to note that this marks the one year anniversary of producing and producing webinars. When the coronavirus pandemic threw the world into chaos a year ago, the Middle East Forum, like many of you, had to adapt and quickly. We took advantage of the time of quiet in 2020 to expand our reach and keep you, our audience, informed and engaged. On behalf of the Middle East Forum, I thank you for being a part of this new venture. We look forward to continuing to provide you in the second year with timely and original information from our staff, fellows, and friends. Today, I am pleased to introduce Elliot Abrams, U.S. Special Envoy for Iran until earlier this year, and now a Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He will discuss Biden and Iran two months in. Following his presentation, Daniel Pipes, President of the Middle East Forum, will ask Mr. Abrams questions. Therefore, we are not soliciting audience questions today. And with that, I turn the discussion over to Mr. Elliot Abrams. Thank you very much, uh, Stacey. I'm happy to be able to do this. <clears throat> Perhaps I can begin by just saying, what is the problem that we are addressing? Uh, what is it that Iran is doing uh, that presents a challenge to the US? And I'd say uh, four things, actually. Uh, obviously, the nuclear program, which looks like a nuclear weapons program. Uh, we know this from the Israeli archive, which showed that they kept all of the weapons information and the team together. We know what countries uh, behave like when they truly do not want an option for nuclear weapons. We saw it in South Africa, for example, under Mandela, uh, Brazil, Argentina. Uh, that is not the way Iran is behaving, keeping lots of secrets, hiding things from the IAEA, um, insisting on the right to enrich. Now the most recent threat mentioned was um, to go to 60% enrichment, which is useful only for nuclear weapons. So nuclear program for a second, uh, support for terrorist groups and interference in Iraq, Libya, excuse me, uh, Le well, Libya, <laughs> Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, um, attack, there was an attack today actually in Riyadh by the, uh, by the Houthis. Third, the uh, missile program. And fourth, um, repression, the human rights violations. We remember November 2019 when it seems that hundreds of people were killed and thousands uh, jailed. <clears throat> Trump policy was uh, what's now known as the maximum pressure campaign. That is, um, we want Iran to do things the regime doesn't want to do. The only way to get them to do that is pressure. Um, we thought that the JCPOA was a very flawed agreement that uh, paved a way over time with reasonably short sunsets <clears throat> for Iran to have a legitimized uh, nuclear program. Um, so uh, we imposed this pressure, although it's wrong to think that that was done over a four year period, it was actually done over mostly a, a, a two-year period uh, before it, it really got going. And the thought was that uh, if uh, Trump had been reelected uh, in the face of four more years of not only the pressure that existed, but ratcheted up pressure, um, Iran would come to the negotiating table. And the goal was a comprehensive negotiation that would cover uh, support for terrorist groups in the region, the missile program and the nuclear program. Why a comprehensive negotiation? Wouldn't that be more difficult than a nuclear, than just getting back to the JCPOA? Uh, hold that, I wanna come back to it in a minute. So the idea was that they would have negotiated if faced with very heavy sanctions over a four year period, that would include first um, a presidential election, which they're having now in June, and then conceivably, um, given his age and health, a succession crisis after the death of the Supreme Leader. Would it have worked? You know, we'll never know. So now we come to um, the Biden administration uh, and their uh, announced policy has been 
we want first to go back to the JCPOA, but not rest there. Um, we need an agreement that is longer and stronger. And we need to cover missiles uh, as well. And the, you know, the regional uh, misconduct. Um, and so first you do JCPOA, then you do the rest. Um, I think there are two very deep flaws in that approach. I don't think it can work. The first flaw is that if you go back to the JCPOA and Iran does what it needs to do to be in full compliance, the United States lifts the most important financial and petroleum sanctions. If we do that, we have eliminated the leverage we need to press Iran on missiles, um, on regional misconduct, on turning the JCPOA into something longer and stronger, much longer sunsets, uh, we will have eliminated that leverage and they won't do it. So that's the first uh, flaw. And that is why, as I was saying a minute ago, uh, the Trump administration thought we would be better off with one comprehensive negotiation where we could use our leverage. Second flaw, I think in the Biden approach is that it makes the assumption that Iran actually wants to go back to the JCPOA, which uh, their foreign minister says they do, but it's not clear to me at all that they really want to. You know, um, their economy is reasonably stable even under the maximum pressure campaign, largely uh, due to China. And you may have seen some press stories today about how China is ramping up possibly even to taking a million barrels a day of Iranian oil. Uh, and that, you know, that can rise. Why would we think that the Supreme Leader wants to go back to the JCPOA? They have to move backwards on their nuclear program. And for what? Uh, so they can have more of a consumer economy so that people can buy a new car, so that people can vacation, instead of vacation at home, vacation in, you know, in Turkey or why would he want that? Why is that a big deal for him? So, uh, you know, at the end of that road is good, normalized relations with the United States. Do we actually think he wants good, normalized relations with the United States? I don't. So where is the Biden administration now? I would say that if it is not possible to go back to the JCPOA, and we can all see that it may well not be, it's unclear what their plan B is. It's unclear what they will do. So far, of course, they, um, they've been, they've, uh, I would say, been hanging tough. Uh, they have not lifted sanctions at all, nothing. Um, they have not panicked. And I think one of the things that Iran is trying to get the West, meaning the European three and the US, to do is to panic. Um, because of their increasing violations of the JCPOA, the Biden administration is not panicked. And they did in the president's first few weeks in power, uh, take military action, that strike, um, not in Iraq, but across, just across in Syria at a Kateb Hezbollah um, location, warehouse. Um, there are some tough questions ahead, I think, for the Biden administration. What do they do if Iran deviates more and more from the JCPOA? Next steps would be enriching above the 20% level they're at, uh, putting online not only the uh, IR4s, more advanced centrifuges, but perhaps even more advanced than that. Um, they have started to exclude IAEA inspectors. They could go further there too. What does the United States do if all of that happens? Because it moves them down the road toward nuclear weapons. Secondly, what does the United States do if in one of these attacks by Iranian backed militias in Iraq, if Americans are killed? We saw the president uh, react militarily to an attack in which Americans were not killed. So presumably he's going to have to do more. Um, it's a very difficult question for the <clears throat> administration. And again, I don't know what plan B is. I, it does seem that the president and the 
you know, the most important people um, on his team, which would be the Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor, are thinking about this uh, anew. It's not 2015, they uh, recognize this. I think one thing is missing. Uh, I believe it's correct that candidate Biden said, as uh, the last several presidents have said, that we will never permit Iran to get a nuclear weapon. We'll do what it takes to prevent that. I don't think President Biden had, has said that, and I think it would be useful and significant um, for him to reiterate. Like my predecessors, I will not permit that to happen. Um, I assume there are debates about all of this, debates and discussions within the Biden administration among the key figures in the, in the White House, CIA, um, DOD, State Department. One sort of uh, one question uh, as to which I do not know the answer is, where on that spectrum is the president, who's obviously the most important figure? So uh, to conclude, um, my view, I guess I'd say is so far so good. The administration is not panicking at what uh, Iran is doing in an effort to panic us. It is not giving sanctions relief um, merely to get Iran to come back to the table. Um, they may have made some missteps in Yemen, but they are speaking now more and more about helping defend Saudi Arabia. Um, they're trying to keep the E3 close to us, which is a useful thing to do. So um, <clears throat> again, I'd say so far so good. And uh, I guess leave it at that so we have some time for discussion. Over to you, Mr. Pipes, to ask some questions. Trying to make myself visible. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much, Elliot, and uh, thank you, Stacy. Well, it's good to hear your uh, optimistic take. So far, so good. Uh, you said that it's not 2015. Would you say that the uh, Iran advisors that were there in 2015 and are back now, mm -hmm. that they've learned something, that they've changed, that there's a different attitude than there was five, six years ago? Yeah, I, I'm, you know, you said it was nice to hear me optimistic. Uh, I don't know if people inside the administration will appreciate it as much. Um, yeah, I think, you know, these are uh, people of, you know, whom I know a bit and of extremely high intelligence, um, none of whom had read any intelligence for four years. So now they're reading in and they're seeing what's changed in four years. Um, and, you know, there were some people in the um, Obama administration, uh, Secretary Kerry obviously comes to mind, for whom the JCPOA was a kind of dogmatic belief. Um, maybe it wasn't for <clears throat> some of the people now handling Iran. Um, I'm hopeful that they are keeping an open mind about this as they look at the situation. How about the Europeans? Do you see change among them from five years mm. ago? You know, it's very interesting. We're talking about Germany, France, England. For the British, uh, this is a new situation. They were in the EU, so you have to try to maintain EU unity. They're not in the EU anymore. So they can take, if they want, a more independent uh, and harder line. The French had a harder line than we did, we the United States. In my discussions with French diplomats, and, and this is not idiosyncratic, I've heard this many, many times, they did not think we negotiated well. They thought we could have had a better deal than the JCPOA. Uh, so they may end up with a, you know, if you will, stiffening the spine of the Biden administration. Uh, the softest line is probably Germany. Um, and I don't think that has changed or will change. Gotcha. Uh, did the Trump administration try to obstruct a return to the JCPOA? And if it did, do you think that will work? How? Oh, no. I mean, I, I'd heard that, that we were doing various things and imposing sanctions and all. Uh, no, I mean, the, the, um, we thought 
there might well be this comprehensive negotiation. And as we got closer and closer, well, first we have the election, but as we get closer and closer to the election and then to the inauguration, it seemed to us, it certainly seemed to me that every additional piece of pressure on Iran was a gift to the Biden administration. It was giving them additional leverage with which to negotiate. They said they wanted to negotiate. So we were giving them cards to play. I don't think that's obstructive in any way. So in other words, <clears throat> the Trump administration people, yourself included, see the possibility of a comprehensive agreement in a positive light. That was something you were hoping to do in a second term and you're perfectly happy to have the Biden people do it in your stead. Uh, yes, um, you know, if we could get an agreement that would have addressed uh, the flaws of the JCPOA, the question of regional misconduct and support for terrorism and the Iranian missile program, that would have been difficult as it is to imagine, that would have been uh, quite an achievement. You mentioned uh, the Chinese and uh, recent deals, but the larger picture is the 400, the supposed $400 billion deal. Uh, does this give the Iranian regime an escape from the pressures that we in the West can put on their economy? Well, in general, yes. I mean, <clears throat> all the business they can do with China <clears throat> helps them uh, diminish the impact of sanctions by the United States or, or other countries as well. I don't believe in the $400 billion deal. I mean, I, I think that's an easy announcement to make. It's an awful lot of money. I think that um, the Chinese are not going to want to throw good money after bad. Uh, one of the things you have to know if you're a potential investor in, in Iran is that uh, A, the sanctions may not be lifted by the Biden administration, and B, <clears throat> even if they are, they may come back in four years, as happened after Obama. So um, I don't I don't think you're going to see $400 million. I do think what you're seeing now um, is, uh, you know, at a, at a, what is the price of oil now? About $60 a barrel. So if Iran is selling a million barrels a day to China, that's a lot of money. Um, and it certainly does help them survive um, US sanctions. And the amount can be lifted. China, you know, imports a lot of Middle Eastern oil. You think they're likely to favor the Iranians oil over other oil in order to help? Yeah, and that's a, I mean, that is a good question uh, because they have had a diversified supply from the Middle East and elsewhere. And in order to give Iran more and more help, they will have to push other supplies to the side. Are they willing to do that? Um, in principle, I think they are. And one of the interesting questions here is, if there is no um, agreement to go back to the JCPOA and Iran deviates from it more and more, in theory, Russia and China should be on our side in the IAEA board saying, not only are you now violating the JCPOA, you're beginning to violate the non-proliferation treaty, um, for example, with respect to inspectors. That has not happened. You remember the Europeans were thinking about uh, introducing a resolution in the IAEA board, <clears throat> pushing Iran to stop doing this. They didn't. I think the reason they didn't was that the Chinese and Russians were completely non-supportive. <clears throat> uh, in theory, they don't want, Russia and China don't want Iran to move down the road toward a nuclear weapon. On the other hand, um, they do like to see the confrontation between the West and Iran. So they're gonna have to make a decision down the road. And speaking of uh, dicey relations for Iran, what about Turkey? Has its role uh, grown? Uh, do you see it increasingly positive, negative? There are certainly tensions between them at this point. Yeah, there are certainly tensions in a variety of places such as Syria. When it comes to the um, economic situation of Iran, I would say Turkey is not um, a huge player. Uh, it's really Asia. Um, and uh, when you look, for example, at where are the frozen funds that Iran would like to get its hands on, 
it's really China, South Korea, uh, above all. It's also um, Iraq, which has bought a lot from Iran. But, but I think the, the, the critical thing here from an economic point of view is Asia and China. Gotcha. Let's talk about uh, Yemen and the Houthis for a moment. There was an attack on a very, very large um, Saudi uh, oil facility a few days ago. Uh, the claim was that this was the Yemenis, the Houthis coming from a thousand kilometers, some 700 miles away, as opposed to Iraq or Iran, which are just a fraction of the distance. It's implausible. Uh, the Saudis couldn't defend themselves properly. The Saudis didn't make much of a noise. Nobody came to the Saudis' defense. Uh, does this suggest that the Iranians can continue to attack almost at will Saudi installations or even Saudi uh, civilian targets? Well, they have so far. Um, this was the, um, this began to happen uh, over the last year. I mean, it's not a novel event in the Biden administration. Um, and uh, if it is happening more frequently now, I think it is part, uh, well, it's two things. It's partly Iran's pressure uh, on us uh, showing, look, we can make a lot of trouble for the United States. Um, and then I think it's partly also just uh, positioning before what could conceivably be uh, some kind of negotiation uh, among uh, Yemenis and outside powers to try to come to, to try to end the war in, in Yemen. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the um, one of the things that Iran is doing here is attacking Saudi Arabia from north and south, uh, as, as well as just from Iran. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's been really quite striking. The Biden administration began with this distancing from Saudi Arabia in Yemen, we're out. Um, and within a matter of days, it had to start uh, sort of turning around and saying, well, but you know, we want to uh, absolutely defend Saudi Arabia. And that of course becomes more and more significant because Iran is more and more frequently attacking Saudi Arabia. And you know, these are not border attacks. I mean, again, there was another one in Riyadh today on an oil facility. Um, so uh, we are going to have to pay more attention uh, to the defense of Saudi Arabia from rockets, missiles, drones. I think today's attack was uh, a drone attack. It is striking, of course, that the Saudis don't hit back. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it looks as if the thing that we should be doing that would be most useful is uh, helping them with defense against these attacks. Again, on the uh, Houthis. The Trump administration in its final days designated the Houthis as a terrorist organization. The Biden administration immediately reversed that. Can you review the state of play? How that well, happened and um, You know, without meaning to be flippant at all about a horrendous situation, the, the reason, the justification for designating the Houthis as a terrorist group is that they are a terrorist group. That is, they commit regular frequent attacks of terrorism, attacks against innocent civilians. Uh, so they have well earned that designation. Um, the, the, I don't think it was wise for the Biden administration to reverse it uh, in one sense at least. It was something for nothing to say to the Houthis, we might contemplate doing this if you would contemplate doing a or B or C, that's a negotiation. But simply to walk away from it in exchange for nothing, I think ran the risk of delivering a message that um, we, want, we just want out of Yemen, that we are simply distancing ourselves from Saudi Arabia. It looks as if those were the messages received by the Houthis whose misconduct has been greater since the Biden administration did that. So. I would have negotiated it rather than simply walking away from it. Gotcha. Uh, turning to home, uh, the Trump administration pursued a series of vigorous investigations into the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, and into Hezbollah and their networks in the United States. Uh, 
where did those end up uh, and what do you see going forward? Um, I would say first, this is not, you know, I was in the State Department, that was not obviously a State Department responsibility. And I'm a little bit um, worried about um, classified information here answering this. Uh, I think what is known is that um, uh, Hezbollah and the Revolutionary Guards, you know, which are two organizations that are very deeply tied together, um, have assets around the world. And I think anybody in the intelligence community would tell you they have assets in the United States. So it's something that every administration um, through Homeland Security, through the FBI, has to keep a very close watch on. That's it? That's it. <laughs> okay. Anything more about what investigations think... turn up? You know, uh, the, the FBI or whoever is going to have to decide what's what they can say about this sort of thing. I don't think you divulged anything there. <laughs> uh, let me uh, close off with a big question. Uh, for decades now, there have been expectations of a counter-revolution in Iran, that uh, the government is weak in so many ways, it's so unpopular. I myself have compared it to the Soviet regime in the 1980s, threatening uh, bellicose abroad, but hollow at home. Nobody believed in that stuff anymore. Uh, the mosques are empty. Uh, the conversions to Christianity are many. Uh, the appeal of the culture coming from Los Angeles is high. Uh, there's almost nothing you can say that's positive. And so it's tempting to conclude that this regime can't continue like this, though it has obviously shown a willingness to use force. And there has not been a clear leader. There has been no Khomeini of the counter-revolution. What are your thoughts on the stability of the regime and the possibility of a counter-revolution? First, I agree with your description. Um, in order to remain in power, the regime um, has had to use uh, force and has had to kill its own citizens in significant numbers. It cannot face, cannot dream of facing a truly free election. Uh, we saw in November 19, a very large uh, uprising in many parts of the country. Uh, this was not, you know, the sort of North Tehran, Upper Middle Plaza. This was a broad-based uprising, um, which they brutally suppressed. Um, the people who are running the regime have not lost the willingness to kill, to remain in power. I do think you're right about um, the, the failure of the ideology for many, many, many Iranians. And one hears, I don't know how you know, one can quantify this, but for example, that young mullahs have a hard time getting married because no young woman wants to have anything to do with them. And as you say, the mosques are um, uh, not well attended in many parts of the country. How does that translate into um, the end of the regime? How does it translate in an opportunity for people of Iran actually control the destiny of their own country? Um, you do have in the Revolutionary Guards and the Quds Force and the Besiege, um, people who at least apparently are still willing to fight for the regime and for themselves. So I don't think it's really possible to you know, to give a number and say, this regime will be gone in 10 years or 20 years. I do believe that um, at some point, uh, the people of Iran will be able to uh, take back their own country. They have wanted to do this for many decades. Certainly it was what was behind the Iranian revolution in 1979. I don't think, I think we've seen in the case of the Soviet Union, that no such despotisms can really last forever. Now the Soviet despotism lasted what, 75 years, um, which would suggest uh, the Iranian regime may have more time to go, but it is coming up to um, you know, a significant change now. Um, 
my expectation for June is that they will put into the presidency someone who is very much a hardliner. Because I don't think the Supreme Leader will risk having somebody who is or appears to be a reformist um, if he is going to die in the coming few years, leaving that person as president uh, during the succession period. So I think you're going to see a real hardliner. Um, but the, the, the moment of change would be uh, his own death and succession. Uh, and again, obviously, we have no idea when that would happen. But I think that's an important moment in the in the history of the Iranian revolution. I do, I would make one other remark about that. And you know, you remember I said, you know, we we thought in the Trump administration, maybe we could get a comprehensive negotiation that would cover missiles, support for terrorism and the nuclear program. There's something missing there. And that's the Iranian people. Uh, and I hope that uh, we uh, and the Europeans remember uh, they're there. Uh, and in any negotiation, any agreement we do with that regime, we cannot abandon them and forget them. Uh, we should be doing more than we are, I think, to help the uh, people of Iran in their struggle, in their resistance, in their uh, fight for the democracy that they have been fighting for for many decades. Excellent. Well, thank you, Elliot Abrams. On that high note, we will... Uh, close our webinar. And again, thank you very much. Uh, Stacy. All right. We've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Mr. Abrams, for taking time to speak with us today. For our viewers and listeners, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email coming out over the weekend. If you have not signed up for our weekly webinar email, please subscribe on our to our mailing list at meforum.org. Again, that's meforum.org. To view past webinars, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or listen as a podcast on any major podcast platform. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a great day.